From the early 1970s, there were dire warnings of a new ice age coming fast. Multiple media sources were telling the public about the coming ice age. In order to give a feel of the sort of panic that was being spread amongst the public at this time, I am going to show clips of a long lost film, The Coming Ice Age, and I'm also going to make comments as we go through the film. In 1977, the worst winter in a century struck the United States. Arctic cold gripped the Midwest for weeks on end. Climate experts believe the next ice age is on its way. According to recent evidence, it could come sooner than anyone had expected. At weather stations in the far north, temperatures have been dropping for 30 years. summer ice are now blocked year-round. According to some climatologists, within a lifetime, we might be living in the next ice age. Most of the inhabitants are Inuit Eskimos, whose ancestors migrated west from Greenland a thousand years ago. Today, the island is poised on the brink of ice age conditions, a critical signal post for changes in the Earth's climate. According to geologists, the last major ice age began on Baffin Island 115,000 years ago. Perpetual snow spread southward over the continents. The weight of many years of snow compressed into ice the ice grew thicker until it covered Canada, the northern United States, and Europe to a depth of two miles. For 100,000 years, the ice remained over large areas of the continents. Then, it retreated to the Arctic, and for the last 10,000 years, we have flourished in a warm interglacial period. Dr. Gifford Miller is a glaciologist from the University of Colorado. He's been studying the climate and glaciers of Baffin Island for the past six years. For the last 3,000 years, the summer temperatures have been getting colder, and the amount of precipitation, and rainfall and snowfall, has decreased so that the conditions have been drier and colder. And at the same time, uh, the glaciers have expanded. And the most recent expansion, which occurred between 300 years ago and the turn of the present century, The glaciers attained their most extensive positions that they had during the last 8,000 years. The summer of 1972 was one of the uh, most severe summers on record, and the ice never melted that summer. And when I returned to Broughton Island, one of the local settlements here, talking to the Inuit people, and they could only tell me that their fathers had told them of a time when the ice hadn't gone out. This once-in-a-lifetime summer ice has surprised old-time Arctic residents. Ernie Sieber is superintendent of Baffin Island National Park and has lived in the Arctic for over 20 years. We had, uh, in 1973, we had uh, ice all, uh, all over at the East Coast. Uh, the fjords, uh, some of the ice in the fjords uh, didn't even leave. And uh, almost every year since, uh, we had uh, Ice is uh, moving in out of the fjords, uh, so it looks like uh, the climate has changed. It looks like it, it turned colder. Since concern for our weather has increased, the park wardens now take daily records of temperatures, wind, and solar radiation. Weather data from stations all over the Arctic is collected and fed into central computers. Balloons are launched every day to monitor the winds and temperatures at high altitudes. The data shows that average temperatures in the Arctic have fallen dramatically over the last 30 years.
most locations, the drop has been about two degrees centigrade. At that rate, the descent to ice age temperatures could take less than 200 years. It is not only the lonely Arctic that has cooled. The whole northern hemisphere is growing steadily colder. There is little doubt that someday the ice will return. At least eight times in the past million years, it has advanced and retreated with clockwork regularity. If we are unprepared for the next advance, the result could be hunger and death on a scale unprecedented in all of history. What scientists are telling us now is that the threat of an ice age is not as remote as they once thought. During the lifetime of our grandchildren, Arctic cold and perpetual snow could turn most of the inhabitable portions of our planet into a polar desert. In Greenland, the snows of centuries have piled up on the largest ice cap in the northern hemisphere. Scientists have recently discovered evidence of a climatic catastrophe. Drilling down over 1,400 meters, geologists have collected precious samples of ancient ice. Some of it fell as snow over 100,000 years ago. The ice is shipped south, where it is kept frozen at minus 35 degrees and carefully divided up for study. By separating out the two forms of oxygen in the ice, scientists have been able to chart the temperatures when it fell as snow. Near the bottom of the ice cap, they found traces of widespread freezing occurring with dramatic suddenness. Dr. Chester Langway is chairman of the geology department at the State University of New York, Buffalo. We have evidence from the ice core studies that approximately 89,000 years ago, the global climate changed from one of greater warmth than today into one of glacial severity. It is possible that we may enter into such a cold climate almost instantaneously in the very near future. If the climate does suddenly cool, will we survive the change? 18,000 years ago, Manhattan Island was buried under a mile of ice. Where the Hudson River flows today, there was a huge glacier. Pack ice filled the ocean off Long Island. We're only beginning to understand the cyclic history of the ice, but evidence is mounting that another ice age is due. The most persuasive data comes from beneath the sea. The research ship Vima sails the world's oceans, taking samples of sediments deposited long ago. A crew of scientists rig a long cylinder and drop it vertically to the ocean floor. The cylinder dredges up mud from the seabed in the form of long cores. The types of tiny fossils found at different levels in the core shows the sea temperatures of the past. Geologists have collected enough sea cores to form a detailed history of climate during the last million years. The cores are analyzed at the Lamont Doherty Geological Laboratory of Columbia University. Dr. James Hayes leads the research. The climatic record in these deep sea cores tells us that there have been eight ice ages in the last 700,000 years. It also tells us when they have occurred. This provides us with a test of various theories of the ice ages. We now have a theory that tells us that changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit act as a pacemaker for the ice age succession. Since this theory can precise, precisely predict when ice ages occurred in the past, which can be tested against these deep sea cores, it also can predict when ice ages will occur in the future. 
from this theory we can say with confidence that we are currently heading toward another ice age in the winter of 1976-77 one storm after another buried the northeast under record amounts of snow months of brutal cold made much of the nation seem like the Arctic. In Chicago, temperatures hovered at 19 degrees below zero. Dayton, 21 degrees below zero. Cincinnati, 25 degrees below zero. But just as today, with scientists not all agreeing on the global warming alarmism, not all scientists agreed in the 1970s on the coming ice age. But enough scientists agreed on the coming ice age to actually write as a group from a conference to President Nixon with a letter warning him of the coming ice age. We have just shown you overwhelming evidence of the cooling of the planet from the 1940s to the 1970s. And as you have already been shown, this cooling was across the entire northern hemisphere and Whilst the evidence in the Southern Hemisphere was meagre, it certainly extended as far as South Africa. So it was a pretty worldwide phenomenon. And they were humming a now familiar tune, a tune that demanded world government to cope with the Ice Age coming problem. But all these predictions were wrong. And the world, now in the 80s, started to warm, just as it had done in this report from 1902 with the Arctic warming caused the build-up to some very hot times in the 1930s. Hence, there was a clear warming cycle up to the 1930s, and then the 1940s cooling, and the 1980s warming. And looking at this USA 1999 NASA graph, you can see how the temperatures work. They, they built up from the 1900, and there in 1921, you have the big peak, as detailed in the newspaper report you've just seen. And there again in 1936, another big peak. But the averages there show a build-up to the 1930s and just into the 40s. And then we start to decline, just as we've seen in the film. There's a decline since the 40s for about 30 years to the 70s and during the 70s. But then it started to pick up again. So what we're seeing is cycles. Now, there's a problem with this 1999 chart from NASA. It didn't reflect the growing CO2. In other words, why, when the CO2 was very low, was it hotter in the 1930s than today? Well, clearly the alarmists couldn't allow this. So you're not going to believe this. They adjusted all the temperatures going back in history. And the result was this graph. So in the space of just two years, there's been a major change in the historic temperatures. Now, the 1930s here are a much lower temperature than the year 2000. You see, now it more or less conforms to the CO2 rise. So, how could anyone have changed the temperature graph so much? Making it to the same scale, just let's look at the two temperature curves. Well, for a start, they do away with the 1921 heat wave. It's pretty cold in 1921, according to this chart. And of course, whilst it's warmer in 1936, nothing like today, which is absolutely absurd. It just ignores all history and all the temperature records taken at the time. Then, instead of the nice sharp drop we had at the Ice Age comet from the 1940s into the 70s, whilst there is some drop, they have minimized it, trying to flatten it out a bit. It just ignores all the history. But after this, in fact, they start to Instead of be lowering the old temperatures, they start to increase them. And let's look at how all this was achieved, because what they've done is depress the heat of the past before 1940, after the 1970s cooling period. This is the zero line, the line at which no adjustment for that year has been made. So when you're below the line, you deduct the temperatures that were red, and when you're above that line, you add on to the temperature readings. So what is being claimed here is quite absurd, that all the people right before 1940 managed to overread the temperatures, so all those had to be deducted and lowered. 
Our normal is between 1914 and 1970 when we mess about a bit, but after that, everyone seemed to underestimate the temperatures, and so we had to add to those temperatures and adjustment. Of course, the result of all this was you lowered the past, increase the future, and somehow conform to the CO2 growth, rather than the original temperatures of 1999 and before, which certainly did not. Then, lo and behold, we now have the blue dots as the temperatures, and that straight line as the CO2 growth, so they can publish the graph showing that CO2 causes that direct temperature rise. The 70s alarm period, well, that's just still a little bit of growth throughout that. The decline has completely gone. But this changing of historic temperatures did not just stop there. They couldn't help fiddle a little bit more. And so if you look at the latest graphs like this one, what you see is a very cool 1920s. You know that 1921 heat wave? And then you build up a bit to the 1930s, but these were still pretty cold. And then that cooling period from the 40s to the 70s, well, that's now not a cooling period anymore. All that you heard about with those rapid drops in temperature in the whole of the northern hemisphere and quite a big part of the southern hemisphere, gone. Now, it's worth pointing out something that's on all the alarmist charts. They actually have a temperature range of around about one and a half degrees from the bottom to the top. Quite a small range. But further, they're not temperatures as such. They're temperature anomalies. And that anomaly means they compare the temperatures to a certain fixed 30-year period. And in this case, they've chosen the 1951 to 1980 period. So these are the differences between that 30-year period and the actual temperature. So it's a very distorted picture because that period they've chosen is a very cool period. So if you're comparing it to the cooling period, as they pretty well are, you're going to get bigger temperature rises showing up than if you compare it to another 30-year period. Every single alarmist temperature graph everywhere is based on temperature anomalies compared to a given 30-year period. And it's important to know which period they've chosen. In this case, they've chosen a cool period to show the temperatures. And this is why, by the way, in that cool period that we know actually existed, they've had to really lower the past to make it even cooler. No matter where you look in the world, you will find this distortion of the historic data. Taking this record of Reykjavik in Iceland, there were times in that cooling period when the harbour was totally frozen over, you couldn't get into it. But all that gets changed with the history change. So these temperature changes go against all sorts of overwhelming evidence to prove they were wrong. Looking at the original Reykjavik data, you see the same old cycle that we had prior to 1999 and the subsequent distortion of history by the alarmists. This original temperature graph is in degrees centigrade straight forward, and it shows pretty high temperatures in the 30s and 1940-ish. But look, after this adjustment, a simply massive deduction in temperatures to meet the agenda. We are now in a world where you cannot trust the media. One time they're saying the ice age is coming and giving all the scientific evidence. The next time they say global warming's coming. What we don't have these days is an honest debate because the alarmists do not allow it. And when scientists do not allow discussion and debate, it's no longer science. I was privileged quite recently to be able to challenge the author of the best-selling climate alarmist book out there. And when I challenged him on the data that he compared his theory against, his scientific work against, he couldn't answer me. He said, Paul, I don't know this subject. In other words, he'd taken the misleading data, the sort of 
trumped-up data I've shown you to prove his theory, and so perpetuating the CO2 myth and how it tallies with the temperatures over the last 150 years, which it does not.